So uh, that was a little New Year's humor having to do with resolutions. Anybody ever make resolutions around here? Did they last more than a week? Nah. So we're going to learn to be resolute without resolutions. And in a few hours, you know, this is like any other day, and at the same time, it's a day unlike any other day, because in a few hours, when the clock strikes midnight, we enter into a brand new year. Another year is gone, right? And a new one is here. For those of us that remember the, the year 2K fiasco, we were planted in front of, if you with in IT at all, planted in front of uh, television watching New Year's celebrations unfold hour by hour across the globe, time zones around the world. The details would take us down a rabbit hole that, would, that wound up being a lot of hype, so there's no use going into them. But people were really scared. They were afraid something bad's going to happen. Well, not, luckily, nothing happened except we learned that most countries around the world celebrate the old year going out and the new year coming in. That's probably not a new idea to anybody. However, did you know that this tradition started about four millennia ago? The Babylonians were the, would make promises to their gods and ask for a better year. The city of Babylon in ancient Mesopotamia was the first New Year's celebration ever recorded about 4,000 years ago. And the Babylonians held their celebrations on the first new moon after the spring equinox and celebrated the festival Akitu, which celebrated the sowing of barley, which was important for them to do because they needed to have those grow, and, and that was their main source of food. And this occurred towards the end of March. So here's they, here they are celebrating the festival. And you can see it was a big deal, a big, big deal. And then along comes the Roman calendar, which was interesting. There were only 10 months or 304 days and March 1st was marked the new year. Now, there's a whole explanation as to how they fit 10 days into what we now say is, or 10 months into what we now say is 12 months, but it's an interesting read, you know. Um, they did it with extending this and subtracting that, and uh, they referred to the extra two months as those extra months. Didn't name them. But March 1st was their new year. On March 1st, the Romans would make promises to their god, Janus, and this would include returning farm tools, uh, paying off debts, um, things they'd borrowed from other people, and Janus was the god of beginnings, endings, transitions, time, duality, the old's going out, the new's coming in, doorways, passages, and frames. And this is also where we get the name for the month of January. Since Janus was depicted as having two opposite faces, and you probably already figured this, one face looked back into the past, and the other face looked into the future. So this brings us to today. And today we have the Gregorian calendar, which was adopted by Pope Gregory in the 1500s, which sets January 1st as the beginning of the new year with a full 12 months. So celebrating New Year's is a public holiday in all countries that observe this Gregorian calendar because some still observe the Janus calendar or the Julian calendar, with the exception of Israel, except not all countries celebrate it on January the 1st. Rosh Hashanah, which you've heard of, is the beginning of the new year according to the traditional Jewish calendar, which, be, which, be, uh, which begins on sunset, Sunday, September 25th, and it's a two-day festival which marks the anniversary of human creation and the special relationship between humans and God, the Creator. There's a lot in that. Something I think we'd all be better off if we did some reflecting on and maybe a little study on that.
Well, these days, most people in the West use the occasion as a time to learn from their shortcomings uh, in the past year and focus on, you know, what are they going to do different in the upcoming year? Kind of a, a, a way to better yourself and, and be a better person. And for the most part, the spiritual side of New Year's res- resolutions from a spiritual point of view are gone. You don't hear much about that. Instead, creating New Year's resolutions has become centered on this personal growth, personal development. It's about me. What can I get? What am I going to do better? How are things going to go better for me? And for some, January 1st is an opportunity to look back at the previous year, burn the ships, right? (laughs) Take no prisoners and leave everything behind that was not good to us or for us. On the other side, some look forward to the new year as a chance to face life with a clean slate, a way to start with a fresh start, create a new you by making a list of what you'll begin doing on the first day of the new year. I don't know if you can read that, but that's kind of telltale, right? Yeah. Some guy's saying, what a resolution. They say, well, that's what you do in the first week of the, you know. <laughs> Whatever your point of view, either way, real change only happens to the degree that we define ourselves as being resolute. The key to any effective and lasting change in our lives has nothing to do with our own efforts. That might surprise some of us here, which is why resolutions don't usually work. We put our own effort into it, but, but that's just not enough. They might last for one week, maybe three months, six months. But in the end, like we saw at that uh, video at the start, we'll have the same list for next year. So instead, Paul tells us that Jesus died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. And so no longer live for themselves, for him who died and rose on their behalf. So when considering real and permanent change, the first thing is to understand that Jesus died for each one of us, and instead of living for ourselves, what do we need to do? It's right there, and right there it says, we live our lives for him. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul explains what real change looks like. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Uh, A lot of us have probably heard these scriptures before, but as believers, as believers were to put off the old self, which is corrupted by deceitful desires. You can see that there. And instead, put on the new self, which has been created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, which is based on truth. So the old self has been corrupted by deceitful desires. And the new self is based on truth. Once we understand that, we can start getting our heads straight as to what it means to be made new in Christ. So to be resolute is to be purposeful, determined, and unwavering. A resolute person has the courage to act with conviction in the face of uncertainty and risk. And if you read anything about the apostles, they were resolute to get the jobs assigned to them done. And they didn't buckle under any kind of risk, uncertainty, or anything. They just pushed through. And even if we aren't in the habit of making resolutions ourselves, the topic's certainly on our minds. Regardless, however, it can be hard because resolutions uh, have nothing to do about changing a, a year on a calendar because that doesn't define our commitment to being resolute. That's something important to think about. Resolutions don't do anything for us and let we, unless we become resolute 
that's purposeful and determined and unwavering about whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. In this case, it's what Paul is telling us to being made new in Christ. So let's take a look at what the Bible has to say about this idea of being resolute. Well, 1 Corinthians 15.58 tells us what being resolute looks like and why it's an important thing to do. Therefore, my brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that In the Lord, your labor is not in vain. And that is, I would say, being resolute. To remain steadfast and unmovable, we have to know the word of God, have to know the word of the Lord, have to know what's in the word. The Corinthians were urged to stand firm in the apostles' teaching and be unmoved by denials of false teachers. You know, there was a whole lot of false teachers around at that time. And... um, They had a lot of problems with people telling them things that just weren't true. So because of that, in Corinthians 16, 13, we're told, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, Why is that? Because we know this adversity is going to come. We know that's going to happen. And we're going to find out in a minute that we really can't do anything on our own anyways. Perhaps it would be better for us to develop ourselves into resolute individuals without worrying about the tradition of of drafting resolutions and making changes to improve our lives, as though we can really make any effective, lasting change on our own in the first place. Anybody tried that one? It lasts for a little bit. The deeper the issues you have, um, the more drastic you are, but the quicker it fizzles out. So as we close this evening, let's look into the Gospel of Matthew and reflect on the words of Jesus when considering what every believer needs to be resolute about. And he was really clear on this. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And went on to say, This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important, which is love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. And if you've been to Rise Church for any amount of time, that should sound very familiar. Love God and love others. And if you find yourself struggling with loving others, make no mistake, We can only love God and people because he's working through us, giving us the desire to do his will. Otherwise, we can't do those things on our own. So we're going to close in prayer in a moment because there's a meal waiting for us. What about that, you know? And um, say goodbye to the folks watching us via computer For the rest of us, we're going to be finding a table, gathering in groups of maybe five, to encourage and pray for each other to be resolute about two things. So this isn't just be a time to get together and say, hey, my resolution is this, and blah, 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 blah. We're talking about being resolute about two things. One is putting off the old self and putting on the new self. That's the first thing. How do we encourage and pray for each other? And the second one is being resolute about loving God and loving others. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us for worship tonight, for insights, for opening our ears, allowing us to hear. May the words you've spoken this evening, that we've heard this evening, 
ring true inside of us. May they cause us to meditate on these things, to understand what you expect of us that we can't do on our own, to love God, love others, to put off the old self, put on the new self. I mean, what, what an incredible, incredible blessing that is. And we thank you for this evening, Father, as a new year is upon us in a few hours when the midnight, when the uh, clock strikes midnight, we'll be into a brand new year. And so we thank you for all you've given us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks. I think dinner is a coming. Yeah, I, well, we, yeah, I'll do pray for us right now for grace, okay? All right, Father, we thank you for uh, this time of fellowship, for uh, provision that you give us. It's amazing what you do for us and how much you want the best for us. We have people that are prepared this meal for us, and uh, we thank you for their efforts. Father, we ask that you'd bless this food that would nourish our bodies so that we can do your work as we go throughout our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Bye-bye.